I'm Dr. Nathaniel Chin, and you're listening to Dementia Matters, a podcast about Alzheimer's disease. Dementia Matters is a production of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our goal is to educate listeners on the latest news in Alzheimer's disease research and caregiver strategies. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to Dementia Matters. I'm excited for today's episode with Dr. Jason Karlowish. This episode is one in a short series we'll be doing discussing the problem of Alzheimer's disease. Now, this, of course, is an important and complex topic, but it's also the title of his newest book. I've asked Jason for more time than usual because understanding the history of Alzheimer's disease and how it has been impacted by the science, culture, and policy of the time will help us explain why we are in the situation we're in now and what we need to do to make real change for tomorrow. Dr. Karlowish is clearly a writer, given he's written this book, as well as other essays in the popular press, but I know him as a physician scientist, more importantly, a geriatrician studying bioethics within Alzheimer's disease and seeing patients and families in clinic directly affected by it. His bio is long, and so the highlights include professor of medicine, medical ethics, and health policy, professor of neurology at the University of Pennsylvania, and the co-director of the Penn Memory Center. And with that, welcome back, Jason, to Dementia Matters. Thanks, Nate. It's great to be here. Now, as a clinician and researcher, you see many dimensions in the field of Alzheimer's disease, yet your book is not about the popular and catchy topic of brain health. Instead, it is a meticulous investigation into the past of Alzheimer's disease. So why address the history in writing this book? Well, I'm not a historian, but I have enough respect for history to know that to speak of the lessons of history sometimes is a little too simplifying. And yet, um, you know, to borrow from Faulkner, the past isn't past, it's not even over. And I, if I think if there's one disease that very much is a victim of its past and very much wrapped up in its past, it's this disease. Uh, going back to when it was first described in 1906-ish or so, and over the course of the 20th century, it truly is a disease wrapped up not just in biology, but in humans and the decisions humans made or failed to make. And so history matters here a lot. And in talking about the history of Alzheimer's disease, you describe changes in definitions, which lead to changes in how you approach your patients clinically, which you describe in your book. Why is it so important that we use correct terms in clinic and in science and out in the community? Well, if I would modify that, why is it important that we use common, well-understood terms? Because if we don't have common, well-understood terms, we have madness, chaos, you know, um, dare I say insanity, namely, you know, the words lose their meaning and what you say isn't what I think. And again, you know, if there's one disease that's haunted by nuance of meaning, and definition and confusion across communities, it's this disease. You know, starting from that most essential fundamental question, what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Which indeed I believe is not is the opening line of the first chapter of the book, you know, um, because that really is the opening line, I think, of many people's entry into living with and understanding this disease. And it's courtesy of a host of shifts in definition that have occurred since Again, it all goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. And so you mentioned the word confusion, which is exactly what I was thinking about. But then you also just mentioned breakdown in communication and and how that would impact uh, people's concerns and, and your role as a physician who's actually taking care of these people. So what do you say to patients when you're diagnosing them with Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, well, right now in 2021 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, when I say to someone, you've got Alzheimer's, I have to think about Alzheimer's understood in at least two broad ways. You know, one is the way that I was trained in and for much of the 20th century was how it was understood. That is, it was a clinical diagnosis, you know, and the sort of catchphrase was, you know, no dementia, no Alzheimer's, N-O, dementia, no Alzheimer's, meaning if you didn't have dementia, we wouldn't even begin a conversation of whether you have Alzheimer's disease or not. Um, Granted, you could have dementia from other causes, you know, but Alzheimer's was the common one. Well, that was what I was trained in. And that, I think, in culture is very much a link that still exists. 
But then we have this other understanding of what Alzheimer's is, namely Alzheimer's disease is a diagnosis separate from any clinical expression. It is the biology. And, and then there's the even more quirky liminal space where you've got to have some symptoms, problems, and the biology, namely you've got to either have MCI or dementia. And so there's at least, I said two, but I guess I've walked myself into saying three ways to think about what this disease is. And as a clinician, and I document in the book, the problem of Alzheimer's, if you're not sensitive to those differences of understanding, you could walk yourself into some disasters <laughs> of meaning and <laughs> you know. Well, and you just used the word I was looking for, too, is meaning, because I would argue that's another dimension or an, another important uh, perspective. And so how do you help patients and their families understand the meaning of a diagnosis like Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, well, I think part of that gets to what's so unique about this disease compared to all the other many diseases uh, that humans get, particularly aging humans, uh, namely you know, it's not just that this is a disease of the brain, but this seems to be a disease that's uniquely a disease of a very cherished value, dare I say, namely the value of our autonomy, um, which is a fairly modern uh, uh, value. That is to say, you know, if you do a search on the uh, concept of autonomy, it's been around for centuries, but it really only became into prominence as a value that all adults should have respected in the 20th century. In fact, not until the latter half of the 20th century, you know. And even now, I think we still struggle with, you know, what do we owe each other to respect our autonomy? Anyway, I explore that in the first part of the book. And I simply make this point, I think, across the book, which is this disease early on gets at someone's ability to exercise their self-determination, to, to live the way they want to live, whether that's right or wrong, good or bad. It gets in the way of that. And and that you have to think about that from the moment you start talking about Alzheimer's and put that label out there, because it's, it is a label that certainly begins to change someone's identity and their sense of self-determination and their positioning with respect to how other people treat them. You know, sort of the ugly side of it, of course, is this idea is the, is the stigmas that surround Alzheimer's. And I go into that right away from the first chapter on you know, the stigmas that surround the disease. And you go into that through case examples and in talking about some of your experiences, both good and bad, as you are evaluating patients. Are there any that stick out for, for our audience that you, you wanted to share? Well, in the book, I talk about Mrs. Uh, Philip and her daughter who came in, the daughter saying, I want to see if my mother has, quote, something neurological, which is that was the most fascinating she had ever heard. And indeed, she did have something neurological. Um, she had Alzheimer's, but she didn't have dementia. She had mild cognitive impairment. And so she became this interesting study in that liminal space of Alzheimer's with a little bit of symptoms, MCI. Um, but then I was able to do both uh, 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 volumetric MRI and amyloid uh, imaging to basically say, you know, you've got Alzheimer's disease. And it was a disaster. I mean, they came back and, you know, they were devastated by the diagnosis all the stigmas of dementia were cascading into their lives. You know, my mother's going to become a zombie. The patient didn't want to see me. She was full of stereotype threats, et cetera. So that was a very vivid clinical example. It showed me how lethal words are and how carefully they have to be deployed. Certainly, it's not a common example uh, in my experience, but it's one we must think about. And then I highlight some others like, you know, uh, Walter Annenberg, Ronald Reagan's ambassador, who basically said, I don't want to see him anymore, him being Reagan, because he's demented and I don't want to be around him, which meant, of course, he stayed away from Nancy, which is a little weird, you know, distancing from both the patient and the caregiver. And to me, the most fascinating is the Lou Ruvo story, which I document, namely how, you know, given their millions from running the liquor business of Las Vegas, you know, he went and built an institute to pursue uh, in the honor of his father who died of Alzheimer's and designed it in ways to avoid patients seeing other patients because of the stigmas that he felt were so profound. I, I thought it was like the stigma of Alzheimer's disease reified into an architectural design. I mean, you couldn't ask for more. As a writer, it's like, you know, you can't get good material like that so often. <laughs> so in the first two parts of your book, you address this changing meaning of Alzheimer's, the factors that lead to some of those changes. Now, one would think, though, you'd be writing about this slow but gradual progress in the science, which you do cover, but you also uncover this social context and the culture and the politics that is equally, if not more, fascinating in the history. So could you start for our audience with the evolution in science and where you think that first breakthrough came? Well, I think in the perimodern era, the first breakthrough was the work that a very small cadre of very collegial collaborative 
largely German national German speaking psychiatrists with neuropathology uh, did. And Alois Alzheimer's was, of course, one of them, but he was not the only one. And in fact, I would argue probably the one that was really moving the field along was Oscar Fisher. And, you know, I was raised with the belief that Alzheimer's described Alzheimer's disease as early onset dementia and senility was senility and it wasn't Alzheimer's. He actually didn't think that. And you can tell in his writings that he was doubting that. Anyway, that was a very pivotal moment when a very unique group of people did some very pivotal work. But we will talk more, I think, later about how that got essentially just forgotten and the story of why is just spectacular. The second pivotal moment in the history, and I truly think it is the pivotal moment, was the work by Bill Clunk and Chet Mattis that discovered amyloid imaging. Um, because what they did was they transformed this disease. They began the transformation from a clinical diagnosis into a uh, biological diagnosis with their discovery of Pittsburgh compound B, the first agent to image amyloid, which never became commercially available. Um, I think the other event was the work of the group at the Mayo Clinic, who essentially began to create that wedge that unlimbered dementia from Alzheimer's, you know, with the cut, their discovery of the mild cognitive impairment, which was an equally fascinating story of a bunch of very well-meaning, charming Midwesterners who sort of you know, discovered it. <laughs> oh, I like that compliment being stationed here in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And, and actually, that's my, my next question for you, is that you do spend a good amount of time in your book discussing that term, which is new in the dementia cognitive impairment vernacular and it's called mild cognitive impairment or more commonly i would think mci so mem memory clinicians neurologists uh, and definitely patients nowadays know that this is a very important term and syndrome so can you tell us from your research what you uncovered about its origins yeah well you know i mean everyone loves this book and all the other books are like everyone else's children not as good but I will. So with that preface, one of the things I did was quickly look as I put this book together was I kind of flipped through how other books handled MCI. And I was astounded, actually, that as prevalent as MCI is, depending on how you define it, there was very little attention paid in most books that wanted to talk about Alzheimer's, about what is MCI, where to come from. So anyway, so I said, all right, I need to get this history down. And it all it's fascinating. This, the history of MCI, I mean, you can take it back to a specific town, a city, in a specific state, and a very specific group of people. Namely, it takes you back to the late 80s, early 90s in Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic, where a very successful, very prominent neuroepidemiologist named Len Curlin landed a grant to understand the epidemiology of Alzheimer's disease using the rich resources that were unique in America, courtesy of the Mayo Clinic's medical record and population-based uh, medical record. And uh, Len Curlin, then senior in his career, got this grant to understand the epidemiology, the demography even, if you will, uh, of, of Alzheimer's disease. Mind you, this was back in the era when you had to have dementia to have Alzheimer's. And Len goes out and I chronicled, I was able to interview, he uh, was deceased, but I was able to interview all of the, the key player people, researchers he assembled it was essentially a group of young guys, you know, in their 30s, kind of starting out in their careers. And uh, he said, I want you to work on this grant. And the fascinating thing was none of them had any idea what they were. In. I mean, they, yeah, I mean, they were clueless, but they, they, it's not like they were like, yeah, I want to discover preclinical Alzheimer's. And, and, you know, and they were like, sure, OK, I'll do your grant, because as I titled the chapter, you know, no one says no to Len Curlin. And, you know, it's a fascinating story of. They designed their protocol, set out to do their work, got their data, and um, suddenly things didn't start to quite fit. You know, um, there was this emerging group of older adults that weren't normal, but they weren't demented, to use the language of the time, and what was going on with them. And, and it was fascinating to, when I interviewed Bob uh, Ivnik and Ron Peterson and, and uh, Glenn Smith, how you kind of, re I got them to sort of relive the sort of kind of like something's going on here. And Glenn Smith tells the story, I have in my mind the image of the Kaplan-Meier curve, because what they started to do was look at their data and say these folks with this sort of not demented but not normal quality, they're at high risk of developing dementia over time. And um, 
a risk that in their data looked to be 10 to 15 percent per year. I mean, that's a spectacular risk if you think about it, you know, um, in healthcare. And thus was born this idea of mild cognitive impairment. And, um, and then I chronicle its sort of difficult birth into the wider world. You know, it was, a, uh, and, and, and some of the wonderful stories that came from, um, you know, the challenges of creating and interpreting cognitive test norms. So MCI became a very interesting study in a host of things. Organized science, the uniqueness of the Mayo Clinic and its medical record. I mean, without the Mayo Clinic, they couldn't have done that work. And, and the Mayo Clinic is truly unique in that sense. I, I walked away with a tremendous respect for what they've done. And, that, and I must say, as a clinician, I, I find that story to be so incredible and, and so the, the events to be so needed, because frankly, at a time where we talk about brain health and we talk about things that people can do, MCI is so critical. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, no, I, I, I've... In my own practice, I was a skeptic, but I've come to see, particularly when you think about how this is a disease of the loss of autonomy, capturing people at the MCI stage, excuse the language, the verb, um, but I think is critical so that they can begin to plan. The problem is we have them waste their time planning advanced care planning for like, you know, 10 years later. I want planning for the next six to 12 months. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing in the MCI story, I don't want to... Um, I, I will say, I want to get this in the record. Um, I was able to interview Bob Ivnick, who was the psychologist who worked on the project. And um, uh, one of our second interviews, I came back to him to, with follow-up interviews. I remember, forget, he had to cancel it. And he said, no, I'll get back to you. And he, and he rescheduled and he did the interview. And in the most just plain, humble way, he said to me, I'm sorry I had to cancel, but I had to go to the doctor. And he sort of tells me I'm, I'm terminally ill. And he would die two months later. Um, and I was so, I just remember that it choked me up because he was so keen to talk to me. And yet here was this guy who was literally living on borrowed time. And he, and I'm so glad I was able to interview him. I'm glad you're able to share that story though, because in essence, a lot of those team members were reluctant in the beginning to take the position. And it really took them to pause and say, wait, this doesn't make sense. We need to explore this. And without that sort of inquisitiveness, we might not have ever come to understand this MCI stage. Yeah, Bob Ibnick was an interesting guy. I mean, he he recognized that the field of psychology had no real norms for cognitive test scores for people above the age of 50. And he suddenly recognized an obligation to create good norms. And he saw this study as a way to do that. Um, yeah, I was very impressed. I, I tried to pitch to the newspapers his obituary, but I couldn't get anyone to pick it up. So anyway. <laughs> Well, one of my favorite stories in your book starts under your, a section that you call Two Men, One Molecule, and Countless Fishing Trips. And so here's where you describe two phenomenal characters in the story of Alzheimer's disease research and advancement. And you've already mentioned their names, but can you share for our readers the importance of Chet Mathis and, and Bill Clunk, two names I had not previously known? Oh, yeah, no, they should be writ. Their names shall be written in the stars. Um to borrow from Cleopatra. Uh, um, yeah, no, uh, they discovered Pittsburgh Compound B, so named by the Swedes who did the first inhuman tests of the compound, um, who prosaically would name their just the t compounds they tested by the city where they were developed, and then they would label them A, B, C, D, et cetera. And so it was Pittsburgh Compound B because Pittsburgh Compound A didn't work. Anyway, I chronicle the story. Um, actually, the overall chapter title is The Olympics of Pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics, the Olympics of pharmacodynamics, a, a phrase that came from Bill Klunk, who was a psychiatrist, um, who was trying to explain how difficult the science was. Anyway, it's a story of a relatively, again, young man who kind of just said, I want to figure out how to image amyloid in the brain of a living human, um, where this was had never been done before. And, and 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 Chet Mattis, who was a very a, a, a bit more senior, successful um, neuroimaging researcher who used PET tracing imaging to understand serotonin metabolism in the brain. Anyway, this somewhat gruff older guy and this somewhat um, kind of preternaturally youthful young guy get together, and um, it's kind of like a buddy story. They they start out a little like whatever, and all of a sudden quickly get into this conversation. I recount the conversation because each one sort of remembered it. Like, you know, you can't get Congo red into the brain because it's a charged molecule. 
And, and, and uh, Bill Clunk says, yeah, but I've got this other molecule called chrysamine G that's not charged. And Bill Clunk, who's a total, you know, he's like, wow. Anyway, I'll give you one side story. Um, Chet Mattis had done his training on California and he learned a lot of his neuroimaging methods by hanging out with Sasha Shulgin. And Sasha Shulgin uh, had made a keg of cash working for Dow Chemical took that money to open up his own private lab called the Shogun Lab, which was dedicated to studying neuropsychopharmaceuticals. And he, he discovered uh, Molly, MDMA, ecstasy. And, and, um, and he was dedicated to tweaking those molecules to, with a therapeutic goal. And Chet would collaborate with him on um, radio labeling them to figure out how they caused the twinkle, as as Sasha described it, because Sasha would test his molecules on himself to figure out the dosing. And I asked Chet, did you ever try any out? He said, no, 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 no. <laughs> but it's a marvel. I mean, these guys labored for some 10 years um, against all odds. I mean, their chairmen were unenthusiastic, you know, why use the garbage can, et cetera. You know, it's not a receptor ligand interaction. So they just, and then, you know, when they did the first, um, transgenic mouse studies, it was a total disaster. And by all rules of science, and this was a kid, this, everything else has been charming and interesting. This was a critical point in the science. By all the rules of normal science, when their studies in the transgenic mice failed, they should have stopped because the next step would have been to inject it in humans. And if the transgenics didn't work, you didn't have the case to go to humans. And they went ahead and put it in humans. In retrospect, they're like, yeah, well, we knew it was going to work, whatever. But you have to understand how every other investigator at that time had the same problem and they all stopped their development, but they persisted and the rest is history. And that's incredible. Would that have even been allowed in present day? Well, you know, they took it to the Swedes to do the injections and it wasn't like they did something that was, quote, unethical. The problem was they were up against FDA rules that probably would have been skeptical about the injections in the first place, but even so would have demanded a far slower pace of discovery. Um, but the Swedes were more tolerant of a microdosing technique. Um, I mean, I think in the end it would have been done by someone, but I remember investigators saying, it doesn't get into the transgenic mice. You can't do this. And they would stop their investigations. I remember one investigator team, I, which I don't quote in the book for reasons that are related to, it wasn't an on record interview, saying that they stopped their work when they, at the transgenics. And they would have been the first had they persisted, like Bill and, like Bill and Chet did. Yeah. So I'd like to end our first meeting today with an explanation of what happened at an important other meeting held January 30th of 2013. Now, this meeting I'm referring to is the Medicare Evidence Development and Coverage Advisory Committee. That's a mouthful. Or MedCAC, I think, uh, where many Alzheimer's disease scientists and some clinicians, their hopes and dreams died. So can you start with the events leading to the meeting and then describe what happened? Simply put, you know, PIV was never pursued commercially for reasons that are, uh, it's, a, it's a fragile molecule to manufacture. It doesn't have a commercial viability. Um, well, it does, but it, it's not worth discussing. Anyway, um, Avid uh, Radio Pharmaceuticals uh, 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 would create the amyloid imaging agent known as AB45, and they would pursue it, prove it, get FDA approval. But the next step was, uh, it's all well to have FDA approval. Medicare's got to pay for it. And given the novelty of the tracer, given the ambiguity of the indications, et cetera, uh, Medicare wanted to get advice from a committee that it has called MedCAC, uh, the Medicare Evidence Development Coverage Advisory Committee. And it's a committee that Medicare will bring sort of new novel tests that they want to get some advice on. So I found the transcript of the hearing. Um, it's available publicly. Um, you just have to have the patience to read it. and. Um, and uh, it was a very interesting day because what you had was a meeting of two very accomplished but very different cultures. The MedCAP group was largely made up of people who were experts in health services research, um, health evaluations, uh, many of them coming out of uh, areas like cardiovascular disease, um, and particularly the chair of the committee who did a lot of work in cardiovascular biomarkers, Rita Redberg, Dr. Redberg. The petitioners were a variety of experts, many of whom you and I know personally, like Steve Solway, in the field of Alzheimer's disease, dedicated clinicians and researchers. So these two groups meet, the one to say to the other, this 
imaging agent is so useful, particularly for people with MCI, to explain why they have MCI and then give them the kind of care they need. And so they present these moving stories of people's lives transformed, like the patient I mentioned earlier, by the results of amyloid imaging, and both positive and negative. And they just cannot convince these, uh, this committee of it. And there's a moment that I recount that sort of popped out on the transcript when um, uh, uh, Stephen Solway um, steps up to the microphone because the um, uh, uh, head of the committee, Rita Redberg, isn't following uh, what's the value of this imaging scan. And he gets up and he says, you know, I think there's been some confusion here today. And um, he explains how, you know, we have this appropriate use criteria. It only says you should use the scan for certain kinds of patients under certain kinds of conditions. And he goes on to say, you know, with that criteria in the scan, I know how to use it. And, and she says to him, what would you do differently if you didn't have this, you know, uh, 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 the, the scan? Um, and he goes on to say that the positive scan will allow him to explain MCIs due to Alzheimer's, he would mobilize the family, et cetera. And she says to him, well, was that based on the scan or their, but not the clinical presentation? And that's where he, so that's like, you know, is it just about the scan? And he says, no, it's the whole clinical evaluation. Um, and that's extremely important. And he goes on and on to explain, you know, essentially what he says is, there's so much nuance. It's not just the scan. You have to figure out MCI. You have to figure out if it's the right kind of MCI, amnestic, et cetera. And what he reveals is, if in the hands of a doctor like me, Steve Solway, we can use the scan responsibly. But in the hands of doctors who are just going to run to the prescribing pad and write for the scan, this thing will be used wild. He doesn't say that, but that's what the committee finally figures out. And they vote it down. Because they say, you know, we can't have a scan like this, which is just going to be widely prescribed. Because not every doctor is like, you know, Jason Carlwish, Nate Chin, and Steve Solway. We, we, we don't have the time, expertise, or ability to diagnose and accurately label MCI to then know when to use the scan. When I read it, I felt like that, that scene could be in a movie or a documentary. I know. I thought of it as a play almost. It's like a one-act play. You know, and it because it ends wonderfully. It was a, it was January in Baltimore, and Baltimore in the winter is cold. I mean, it's 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 an East Coast you know uh, cold, uh, but for whatever odd reason, the temperature that day climbed into the fifties, such that by the end of the day, it got warm enough that there's actually a thunderstorm. <laughs> and I thought, what a wonderful day! Like thunder in winter, you know. It's like it was, the day was just this un, you know unusual day, and you know, <laughs> with this gothic horror story of a thunderstorm. <laughs> And I'm glad you shared it because to me it seems a bit for I don't know like a it's foretelling of something because we have blood-based biomarkers which we're not going to talk about in our episode today but maybe towards the end and it makes me wonder if the same arguments are going to be used for or against that. So thank you Jason for our first installment highlighting part 1 Alzheimer's Unbound of your book The Problem with Alzheimer's How Science Culture and Politics Turned a Rare Disease into a Crisis and What We Can Do About It. I look forward to our next discussion and how culture, society and politics influence what was thought to be a normal part of aging into the disease causing our present day crisis. So thanks for your time. My pleasure Nate. It was wonderful. Look forward to talking some more. Please subscribe to Dementia Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, or wherever you get your podcasts. And rate us on your favorite podcast app. It helps other people find our show and lets us know how we're doing. Dementia Matters is brought to you by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center combines academic, clinical, and research expertise from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center of the William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. It receives funding from private university, state, and national sources, including a grant from the National Institutes of Health for Alzheimer's Disease Centers. This episode was produced by Rebecca Wazaleski and edited by Bashir Adin. Our musical jingle is Cases to Rest by Blue Dot Sessions. Check out our website at adrc.wisc.edu. That's adrc.wisc.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. If you have any questions or comments, email us at dementiamatters at medicine.wisc.edu. Thanks for listening.